access all that God has for you. Hi, welcome back to Church on the Couch. We're glad you've tuned in with us here today. Today we're talking, uh, continued on in our series of spiritual warfare, which is an overflow of our spiritual health uh, series that we've been doing. If we don't pay attention to all things that are in the spirit, we're going to be missing out on a lot of things. I often tell people that, you know, it's, it's great that we go through the scriptures and learn Christian disciplines in our flesh. We absolutely need to do that and continuing to do that on an ongoing basis. But there's a spiritual battle at play, too, that is going to wreak havoc on our soul health. And so if we did not address it, then we would be missing out on a whole lot of uh, the pieces of the puzzle. And so with that, we the last couple of weeks talked about what it is to have demonic attack in your life, how to recognize it, and how to defeat it. And now on the flip side, I wanted to give you on the other side of the spiritual battle uh, in the heavenlies is the angels. And so today we're going to talk a little bit more about the angels, what they do, what they provide to us and for us according to God's will. It's important for us to know what they do, how they do it, and how frequently so that we can access all that God has provided for us. If God has provided us angelic power to get through this world, then wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. I want to I get in on that. I don't know about you. That sounds like a pretty sweet deal to me. And uh, so as we talk about this, we just don't want to leave uh, the, this world and our lives just up to our own capabilities. Yes, we need the Holy Spirit to guide us, but he's also provided us angels. And so as we talk about this, I'm going to be highlighting what, what their purpose is and uh, a few different examples through Scripture, the Old Testament and New, of how they have related to humanity and to salvation. So just a few things about what angels are, is they are created spiritual beings. When they take form to be seen by these eyes, which are made to see other atoms, not spiritual things, then they have to take on a manifestation of creation to do so. So they are created, they're not infinite, they are created, limited but powerful spiritual beings. And the reason why I say limited is they're not infinite. They are not everywhere all the time, and they are not all-powerful like God is, even though, and they don't know everything, even though they are very intelligent, even though they can only be in one place at one time, and even though they are very mighty and strong. And we also know that they are innumerable. So that means that there's enough angels to go around to help all of us. Uh, we're told in Scripture that uh, the addition in math in, in the ancient days wasn't quite done the same as ours, but it was, it's literally meaning in the hundreds of millions of angels that exist, that it's beyond our comprehension. So if there's that many angels, we should be uh, thinking, you know, maybe we've encountered some in our life. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later here today, too. But I just wanted to get you on some of the character of it. Uh, I think it is interesting to see that, you know, one thing that angels can say that we can't say is, I have never sinned. That's incredible. Think about how holy these angels are. You know, last week we talked about how special it was that uh, even though that angels are not made in God's image, we are. We are the chief of God's creation, and they are ministering spirits to serve us. We learned that angels cannot say, I am redeemed. That is a very powerful thing that we learned last week uh, that we can do that the angels can't. But there's something that the angels can say that we can't. That they can say, I have never sinned. Wow, that's pretty incredible. So they are holy. So we want to make sure that we are treating them as such and understanding that even though they were tempted, uh, only certain ones sinned. And those that sinned, God did not spare. And those are what we call today fallen angels or demons. And the holy angels have been holy from creation until now. It does appear in Scripture, it doesn't say one way definitively or the other, um, that angels can live forever. You know, they have a, a definite beginning because they were created by God. But being spirit, it appears that they just don't die. Uh, we talk about the Satan being, and Scripture teaches Satan was there in the beginning and when God created him, and he still exists today. We learn that uh, many of the other angels, like Gabriel and, and the archangel Michael, who were cited as being in the book of Daniel 600 years B.C., and then said to be still with us today, uh, they are definitely ancient, intelligent beings. So think about the wisdom that even if they weren't programmed with any kind of intelligence when they were first created, um, just think of the wisdom that, how much wisdom they have from just being alive this long and dealing with generation after generation of humanity. It kind of gets you an interesting perspective of what, what they must view of us uh, having seen every generation that has ever lived. And they have worked and helped each and every one of those generations for people to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. So now onto the roles of angels. Angels, first and foremost, by being holy, are examples to us. They always obeyed God, which we just learned about. Next is they protect us. We learn in Psalm 91 that God sets his angels guard so that uh, we will not falter. God sends his angels to protect us. He sends his angels to advance ministry that we are doing. He sends angels to protect us from the attack of the enemy. And he sends angels so that it actually ends up glorifying God even more. 
because if angels, which are creative beings, can do the incredible things that they have done, how much more powerful is God? So by their presence and by their power being displayed and knowing that there is a God far above all of that, that helps us to see and give the proper understanding of God's glory. And I'm going to focus in a little bit on the protection from Satan. This is important for us. Jesus taught us how to pray. And when he did, he told us to pray protection from the evil one. We see that we've uh, prayed in the past and many saints have prayed in the past. And it has been angels that God sent to distract and disarm the enemy. And so with that, I'd like to point out that it, one of the easiest things that Satan can do to attack us is that when we are not doing well, that is when we are the most susceptible. This is why spiritual health, that this whole series that we're doing, is vitally important with the spiritual battle. Because if somebody's living their life near the edge, it doesn't take much for them to be poked to go over the edge. It's like, for example, of why we always say that if someone has a stressful job, they end up taking that stress out on their family. That's not right. Um, but we know that when, when we're stressed, we're eventually going to pop. We're eventually going to, if we don't get the self-care, if we don't get the rest and eat right, sleep right, get our priorities straight, simplify our lives, those simple disciplines, uh, we find ourselves that we will get agitated, especially during a global pandemic that we are dealing with here where the whole world is in crisis, economic, people's health has been on the line because of all this as well. So a lot of people are carrying up all these insecurities in, and it is easy that when we get wound up about those things, that Satan can just pile on little tiny things, and it ends up being the straw that broke the camel's back. And so with that, we get it. that's why we need to take every thought captive, and why we need to pray, and why this is a spiritual warfare, is because we need to make sure that we are not uh, carrying on emotions that have been provoked by Satan. And by doing that, that will help us to uh, live the right way. So when we have thoughts of anxiety and fear about the events that are to come, we can pray, and then maybe God will send us Holy Spirit, maybe he'll send an angel. But to help us to get our view correct and to eliminate the attack of the enemy. And you know what it's like, I know if you've ever, if you're a child or you've grown up in a household with other children, you knew how to press your siblings' buttons. You knew that when they weren't doing well, you could just do one or two little things to get them to go sideways and then they get in trouble by the parents. Uh, all of us at some point were experts in that in our lives and th you know what, Satan is a lot smarter than an eight-year-old. He's been around for generations as well. He knows how to push your buttons. Be aware that he's trying to exploit uh, our natural tendencies of fear or anxiety or whatever that is and to heap on top of that to wind us up to make us sin and ultimately to make us pull back from God. And so now I'd like to go through just a, a bunch of uh, verses to show about some of the activities so you can get an idea of how they operate uh, from what the Christian can know. We know God obviously understands them from a very different perspective than we do, but it's important for us to know uh, a few things about angels. So we learned first thing is that when God was creating the universe, that uh, the angels were created in that first six days as we are taught, and that when humanity was created, that they rejoiced. They rejoiced and they sung in the heavenlies. The next time we see that kind of rejoice and singing in the heavenlies is when Jesus was born in Luke chapter 1. We see that when they shows up to the, uh, the angel shows up to the shepherds, then the whole heavenly host appears in the sky singing and praising God. What an incredible sight. So a couple very cosmic uh, examples of angels showing up. Then next there's some pretty mundane ones. Even in Hebrews chapter 13 it says, some of us have entertained angels without even knowing it. And so let's just be kind to strangers because you never really know who we're actually ministering to. And then on top of that, there's numerous ones where they just seem to appear as normal people. Uh, and we learn that in the book of Genesis where Abraham is just found out from a few angels that Sodom and Gomorrah was going to be destroyed because two angels had showed up to him and they went and to save Lot and to pull him out of there so that he would not perish along with them. We see that an angel showed up in a, in a little bit more of a cosmic sense, but still in a very personal sense to Daniel in the lion's den. It says that God sent an angel to shut the mouths of the lions. And then we also learn in a few other circumstances that uh, we learned that angels were protecting and helping Daniel as well too, but that was a spiritual battle that was happening uh, that Daniel was unaware of that was happening for three weeks. And then the archangel Michael showed up and told him, yeah, I've been battling with Satan for three weeks. So that's why my delay, my apologies. It's kind of interesting. This is why we never give up prayer because we don't know why there's a delay. Is it that God said no? Or is it that, that there's the archangel like Michael, like, I'm working on it, hang on, I'll be there soon. And so let us never give up and let us know that, you know what, these angels, they're busy. Just by even me telling you these things, if, if, if an angel could be held up, that means they're busy. 
And if they're busy, and their whole primary purpose is to glorify God in humanity uh, and, into, and to lead us to the gospel, then we too should be really busy. Like, well, how can we be idle if we know that this is what myriads upon myriads of angels are doing in the heavenlies to help us? That they're doing all the work and we're not? That really motivates me to know that the more I work with God, the more likely the increase in chance that I will see an angel. And in the book of Acts, we see numerous angelic sightings happen. Some of them seemed a little more cosmic than the next. Like, you know, we think of angels like with wings coming in power. It's kind of like how uh, Gabriel showed up to, to Mary, uh, was just in a blinding light, no mention of wings, but definitely not just a guy showing up like the angels did to Abraham. We see it again, too, that there is someone who looked like a warrior appearing to Joshua. Joshua was, took over from Moses, was entering the promised land, and he sees someone with their sword drawn, and he shouts ahead, hey, are you with us? Or are you for them, our enemies? And he said, these are famous words that we can all live by. Neither, but as captain of the heavenly host, here I now stand. And then Joshua bows his face to the ground, realizing this is no mere man. This is no mere soldier. It is not even a mere angel, but the chief of angels, likely even someone like Michael himself. And what was an important distinction is even though Joshua was doing God's will, we always need to make sure that, and make short accounts to make sure that the mandate that God has given us, that we are still doing it correctly. The angel was smart to say, I'm not on your side, Joshua. I'm on God's side. What side are you on? That will determine if we're enemies or allies. So this is very important for us to learn that lesson. To always check and say, am I on God's side? If I'm on God's side and you're on God's side, there'll be unity. That's a very important directive that we learned from these wise creatures called angels. And the next, you know, in the book of Acts, what we see as a whole flurry of them coming. You know, we see that the, one of the deacons named Philip, he was walking along the road because he was told to go that way by an angel, and that's where he met the Ethiopian eunuch. You can read that in Acts chapter 8. Then later, there is a God-fearing man who was not a Jew who was in Israel. His name was Cornelius, and an angel appeared to him and said, go get uh, Peter. Peter's got the information that you need for eternal life. It was an angel that showed up to him there. There's an angel that helped Peter to get out of jail when he was arrested. There was an angel that uh, showed up to Paul when he was distressed and uh, not knowing what to do. He was imprisoned for his faith. And an angel gave him encouragement saying, no, you need to take this gospel right to Caesar. That's why you've been arrested. It's so that you can go to Caesar himself. That was God's ordained moment for Paul. And God sent an angel to give him that encouragement just an encouragement. Sometimes they show up in strength for a great provision, but I can tell you this, sometimes encouragement is worth more than a million dollars. And in Paul's case there, he got to take the gospel, and the very first generation that the gospel existed was able to take it to the head honcho many thousands of miles away within that short time frame. And angels helped along the way. And then finally, I saved two examples for last for an important reason, because obviously if an angel shows up to us in power, we're going to be able to see it. If we see a heavenly host show up in the sky, we're going to see it and understand it. So I don't really need to give you much teaching on that other than when you see them, obey them, because they're probably here to bless and to do something great. But I want to talk to you about the maybe the times that they show up unseen. Now, we're never told to conjure them up or try to directly talk to angels. We're told to talk to God and he will do the dispatching. Psalm 91 says, God will dispatch them. So we never want to call out, hey, Michael, can you come visit me? We never, ever, ever, ever do that for one important reason. A, God said he's the Father and will provide, so go to him. Don't go to somebody else. And B, we learn that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Satan has less authority, less power, and of course a lot less glory uh, than the angels do, so he mimics them to try to trip, them, trip us up with them. So this is why we don't rely on angel sightings for our gospel or our worship, is because it could be Satan disguising himself as a righteous angel when he's not. And he's, a, he's a cunning liar, so we need to make sure that we have ourselves guarded. But what we learn in the Old Testament, there's two examples that I'd love to highlight to you today, and that's when the angels show up and you don't know anything about it. So there's an Old Testament false prophet called Balaam, and he's riding his donkey along a pathway that has a wall. And as he's doing so, his donkey sees up ahead there's an angel with sword drawn ready to kill Balaam because Balaam was cursing God's people. And why only the donkey could see the angel and not Balaam, I assure you I don't know, but God has authority over who can see what angel when when. 
And this, ain't, this is a famous story out of Numbers 21 because the, the donkey sees it and doesn't want to go into danger. So it, it moves to the left and to the right, sits down, and even crushes Balaam's leg against the wall so to not go forward. And Balaam's losing his mind. Like, he's literally having, like, road rage at his donkey. Uh, and, and he ends up beating his donkey because the donkey wouldn't obey him. And then the angel opened up Balaam's eyes to see him, and then he realized the danger that he was in. And so sometimes we don't always see what the angels are doing around us. And the next one, I want to read to you the whole story. It is out of Second Kings. And it is, uh, well, why don't I just read it to you, and then that will help you to uh, get a, a glimpse of what may be going on behind the scenes. Why? So that we can be confident that even though we do not see these angels, that God has set them guard. That's the point I'm trying to get to you today. So let's look at 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 onward. It says, Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel, and after conferring with his officials, he said, I'm going to set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Beware of passing that place, because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked out uh, the place indicated by the man of God, and time and again, Elisha warned the king that he was to be on guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded them, Will you not tell me which one of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who was in Israel, tells the king of Israel uh, the very words that you speak in your bedroom. Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men to capture him. The report came back, he is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and they surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, and an army of horses and chariots had surrounded the city, Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, Oh, Lord, open up his eyes so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down towards him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, Strike these people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness, and Elisha, as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, uh, This is not the road, or, and it's not the city. Follow me, and I'll lead you to the man that you're looking for. And he led them straight to Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open their eyes so these men can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes, and they looked. And there they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, well, Shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Can you imagine a whole army being stuck inside your walls now? And uh, Elisha said, Don't kill them. Would you kill men that you've captured with your own sword or bow? No, set food or water before them so that they may go eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after he had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. And so the bands of the, of, from Aram Stop reading Israel's territory. A couple things we could learn from that is that even when you get your enemy where you want them, you bless them, not curse them. Because we're looking to redeem people, not bring judgment. That's God's job. But the interesting thing here is that there was angels set guard. The servant couldn't see it, but Elisha knew who was with him. It is kind of interesting, we learn in the New Testament as well, that when we learn about God's grace and we know how much he loves us, that if God is for us, who can be against us? And then right here, Elisha is saying to his servant, uh, the same thing, but just about angels. Look, if they're for us, look, who, look at the numbers we've got. I'm not worried at all. You know what? When you know you've got the enemy outgunned, you can rest. But if you don't know that you've got the enemy outgunned, we get fear and anxiety creeping up inside of us. So I want to encourage you, there are more that are with us than are with him. We know that there's far more angels than there are demons. We do know that God the Holy Spirit is far more powerful than any other human uh, evil on the earth. That we know that God is with us and that he is advancing his plans here on the earth. These are the things we need to know about God's angels and God's purposes through his angels so that it helps us to be aware and have confidence as we walk through this life that even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we shall not fear evil because the Lord is with us. He is with us always with his abiding presence. He is with us at the Holy Spirit, and he is also with us with millions of angels. It's pretty incredible to know that this is out there. I hope your eyes are open to see what is out there. Now, I want to encourage you, too, that angels also like to be incognito. That means they don't like to get attention from themselves. Well, we learn very much through Scripture that people have a tendency to worship them. We do know that many false religions are based upon demons, so false angel worship. 
We don't go to them for that. And because they know that, they often do their work behind the scenes. You, I guarantee, have been blessed by an angel at some point in your life. You have. But you probably didn't know it because the glory is to go to God, not to them. They are very humble creatures. They are very humble. They want all the glory to go to God and not to them. And that's an example for us too. That when we do ministry and people praise us, we say, no, we could do nothing lest our master gave us these gifts. He is the one to be glorified. So to recap these first two points, it's, I wanted to show you and teach a bit about what angels are and how God has placed them in our lives for his advancement of the gospel message. And second is that, you know, the way that we should feel about this, I always like to say, like, what should we think about it? So I just unloaded a bunch of scriptures on you. Certainly was not exhaustive. You know what? You can even just Google angels in the Bible and you can have do your own word search and find incredible amounts of information more to what I just kind of summed up much of their activity. You know, I didn't even get into the fact of how the angels acted during the ten plagues in Egypt and how one angel was a pillar of fire at night and a uh, cloud by day. So they take on natural phenomenon too. Um, but the reason why the, this focus message is on your spiritual health, not on idolizing uh, angels or just to see how cool they are, although we did highlight that, that they are pretty cool. If you can turn the fire or cloud, that's like... Marvel stuff, like this comic book stuff. Anyway, uh, and then as we move on, what we should be thinking about this is realizing how many protections God has put in place for us. How, uh, how should we then feel knowing that God's got us? If God is for us, if there is more for us than against us, God, the Holy Spirit, angels, all of that, way more numerous than any other enemy we could come up with, man, that should make us feel safe, first of all. That should help us to not fear, it should help us to be able to lift up our chin to, to know that if God asks us to do something hard, even if it means the costing of our own life, that we will be able to lift up our chin and say, this is my moment because it cannot not be. Did you hear that? When we live our lives for Christ and when things don't go our way, we often attribute blessing to comfort. But blessing truly is, is living inside of God's purpose. And sometimes God brings glory to himself, which brings other people to faith, by somebody dying. Sometimes it's by somebody living. So this is why we always pray that, God, your will will be done. We want healing. We pray for people. But sometimes someone sticking to their faith, going to the grave, helps other people to know, you know what? They believe they knew where they were going, and I need to look into this myself. Let your whole life be, no matter what it is, to know that you will never be alone, that you will always be there. In fact, there's plenty of uh, scripture innuendo that at the moment of our death, there are angels present for each and every one of us. That happens over 150,000 times a day with the size of the population we have now. And we know that there are millions of angels, so we know that is possible. That angels escort us, they care for us, they take our souls right to heaven. How cool is that? If God is for us even in death, if angels are with us too, what do we have to fear? I hope that the feeling that you have over learning about all that God has provided through angels, that you just have just a giant sense of peace right now in this moment. You know, you know what, I, I don't need to worry about tomorrow. I don't need to, to be fearful about what's going on in the world or what is going to happen in X country or what's going to happen with this pandemic. I can just live today and I can worship God. But another overflow of that too is like, well, wait a minute, they didn't, they didn't come to make my life peaceful so that I could sit and do nothing. If angels are at work to this very day, and man, like when do they ever clock out? I don't know if they get vacation time or what, but if they've been at this for thousands of years and they have been helping humanity all along, and even so much so that they even get tripped up sometimes and, and are delayed in coming to us, then the next thing that what we should do about all of this, so it's like think, feel, do. So there's the fire hose of information I gave you uh, and then what that should do in our hearts. And now here's the do, is that we should do. Because if, think about it, angels do not need to work in order to be saved. They're already, they're already there in heaven. They've never sinned in the first place. They have no need for it. But yet they're helping us. You know, when I see someone who is helping someone and the helper isn't even trying, then that is an indication that help needs to stop. It's what we call tough love. I can tell you this. I want more angelic presence in my life. I don't know about you. And I know they're very busy. So here's the deal. If you're doing what they're doing, the chances of you running into them uh, are increased with the amount of time you spend doing it. So that means that when we're tempted to be angry, forgive. Because there, there may be an angel present helping you to get over that. When you are tempted to see the evil in somebody else and wish for their death, 
Uh, and that's a pretty extreme example. But no, we should be prompted to say, no, God, I pray that you would get rid of the evil out of me and all of humanity, and that that person who I just was tempted to hate, that God, that, that you would cause me to love them and that you would help me to pray for them that they would get to heaven one day. We don't want to see judgment on anyone because we don't want Satan to win another soul. This is why there's got to be a fire in our bones about this gospel message that came to us because we do not want Satan to be glorified. And even by us acquiescing, we think like, uh, which means pulling back, uh, taking it easy. If we're letting Satan roam around looking for someone to devour and we are not out there working with the angels to protect it, then we are complicit with Satan's vision for this world. We don't want anyone to die apart from on their way to heaven with Jesus Christ. And God has sent his Holy Spirit, he has sent his Son, and he has sent holy angels in hundreds of millions to help us along this way. I hope this really helps us to, to get an idea of that when we don't engage in ministry, when we don't use our talents, our times, and our treasures for the Lord, then what we are showing is that we are in agreement that Satan can continue ruling and that we really don't care where anybody else is going. Now, again, I never want to be like the finger-wagging church, like we're telling people that, 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 you know, that we need to judge them because they're doing wrong. But this is supposed to be very inspirational, is that if we are doing God's will, we get to see angels, we get to have peace in our hearts, and we get to stop the devil from winning. Can you believe that? Did you ever think that you, by sharing the gospel to somebody else, that if you could just muster up the courage where you think they're like, I can't tell them, that's just, I'm just not, I'm too shy, I can't, and then, and then you muster up that to give that, and then Satan loses another one? How amazing is that? And the angels glorify. It says the angels sing when another person is saved. You know, be a part of salvation, and you just might hear some of those heavenly tunes. I can tell you, I don't want to get into any of my experiences because that's not the point, but I wouldn't be teach, teaching this if I didn't believe it through Scripture and see it in my daily life. I, I'm telling you this straight out. The more that you are involved with God's gospel, the more you are going to see incredible things, and you're not even going to be able to explain it to somebody else, which is why I don't even bother trying half the time. Um, but I want to encourage you that you are created to be here for a purpose. As angels have a purpose, so do you. That's the cool part about this, that God knew exactly where he wanted to place you in history and exactly where to put you on this globe. You are no accident. You might be an accident in the world's eyes, but you are no accident. You are right on time and in the right place, and that you can start over right now. God allows do-overs, and he has a lot of grace to give. So don't be uh, holding shame and guilt over what we may or may not have done in the past. That's from the devil. Conviction is what comes from the Holy Spirit, which is, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And that should drive me to want to do this. Conviction will lead you forward. Conviction will help you to right the wrongs and to go forward. Shame and guilt come from the devil. So don't ever, ever hear guilt or shame on my voice as I'm trying to teach uh, these incredible things that we get to be a part of. And that's why I want to say, you are here, you have a purpose, and this is why we join up together, all of our purposes together as a team, because no person has every gift. So we, we develop teams so that we can do ministry together, and the team is called the church. God invented the church, not the church building, the church body of believers. It's his idea, and it's how the vehicle to which he said that the hope of the world, Jesus Christ, would go out through. So we would be uh, acting in defiance if we don't team up with a local congregation to do ministry because I have one gift, you have another, and as we come together, we can form uh, a unit where everybody is covered and that, you know, even though some may be evangelists, some may not be, that the evangelism gets done. Some people may like to uh, help other people with physical needs, and others may just like, you know what, we just got to teach the gospel. Well, guess what? It all gets done in a scenario like that, that we can uh, rest assured that our brothers and sisters in Christ have got this. And this is why we celebrate this famous gospel that has come down to us. And it is famous because it is true, that Jesus Christ, he came, and God took on flesh so that he could live a perfect life to be an appropriate sacrifice, the righteous for the unrighteous, and that he was killed and that he rose again three days later, according to the scriptures, and then he ascended to heaven, proving that he had the power over life and death. And he offered it to us, to anyone who would follow him. And so I want to encourage you. I know that God didn't make a broken world. He made it perfect. Humanity botched it, and God offered to fix it through his son. I pray that if you can be, help us to become a part of this gospel message, I pray that if you're watching this and you have never come to faith before, that uh, you would trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is simply this. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus to forgive me. I received that free gift. Now help me to follow you. 
so that one day I can be productive here on the earth and get to see you face to face in heaven. That's as simple as it is to be a Christian, is to come to faith and to start walking out our faith in fear and trembling together without guilt or shame, but with conviction and determination that I know the gospel that has come to us is going to go out from us. It can't stay with us. I know it's going to go because Jesus said this gospel is going to go out to the whole world and then and only then will the end come. Everyone's going to get a chance to hear and whoever is a part of God's kingdom here on the earth will be a part of God's kingdom in heaven. Well, thank you for tuning in. I hope this helps you uh, to have your spiritual eyes awakened, as it were, just like Balaam had his eyes opened and Elisha's servant had his eyes opened to see that God is for us and numerous angels are for us. So who can be against us? Thank you for tuning in. God bless. Have a great day.